Hi, thank you very much for having me. Um, as I mentioned, and love, thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, my name is Mariko, and that's my Twitter handle. I don't have this slide up on my Twitter yet, but I will be posting, so if you are curious, please follow, and um, I will be doing so right after this talk. So the title of talk, I was like, when organizers asked me to speak about knitting, and I was like, well, what am I going to talk? And I came up with this title because it totally makes sense to me. But I realized it doesn't really make sense to anybody. So I need to start with my story of how I came around this intersection of craft, art, and tech. So I started knit by hand as a hobby when I was seven or eight years old. And it has been my winter hobby. It was not never serious. It was something that I always done, but never really took it seriously to study or anything. But it became really intense when I moved to New York. One winter in New York, I was freshly moved there from Tokyo. I was waiting for my green card, so I couldn't get a job. And it was two weeks of intense winter storm. And I was knitting as my hobby. And I decided to teach myself JavaScript. Why? I don't know, maybe because I was project manager before and I met a lot of developers and I talked to developers and I organize and write about system but never load a code, so seemed like a great opportunity. Maybe I wanted to be sneaky project manager again now that I know code when somebody submits an estimate two weeks more than that, supposed to be, maybe I can point that out. Maybe there was that. Anyway, so I started learning code, and it quickly I realized that the knitting itself and coding is super, super related. Both of them are binary knitting. The atomic unit for knitting is purl stitch and knit stitch, and combination of those two creates a pattern, much like computers. And both of them are like a lot of array manipulation, so doing map and reducing on the loops on the needle creates a triangular shape. So from there, I was like, this is super interesting. I am going to investigate. And I decided to make my own domain-specific language called 64 Stitches. It's more like art project. But lets you create a 64 Stitches worth of pattern on code. And I made it specifically so that the code you write on the text editor will look like a knitting pattern that somebody leads to create a textile. From there, I learned there's this thing called knitting machine, and I can test these patterns pretty quickly because hand knit takes a long time. And I wanted to test more computational, mathematical, a lot of patterns. So I got into this thing, and I quickly learned that this thing can be hacked. And keep in mind, I was not a professional developer yet. I purely purchased it to make my craft, and I was had no intention of being a hardware hacker or anything. But I realized that it's possible. And I started to research about, OK, what's going to happen if I want to do this? Turns out it was a lot of software than hardware. Only thing I did on hardware was creating a special kind of USB cable, pulling the one wire out and then cutting off and then like rewiring it again. So like 99% was about how to figure out a code file that this knitting machine from 80s can lead. And I have a, a lot of research about it. Anybody, if anybody is interested, I'm more than happy to share. But because of that, my weekend desk started to look like this. I have a code, I have some kind of visual, and then I have yarn and I have a knitting machine. And I became kind of this hardware person because I knit on knitting machine. But as I mentioned, it's about software, and the only thing I made was like USB cable. So I was like, hmm. I don't, I'm not really comfortable with this. I did try to make a hardware project, but there was no way I was confidently like, yeah, I'm a hardware hacker now. Um, my day job is JavaScript engineering, and you know, I make websites and web applications. So today, I thought, 
instead of talking about how knitting is related to code and you know the mathematical property and it's the really interesting thing, but I wanted to talk about how I got into hardware and I did one project, it was really frustrating, and how I came around doing those projects. So the thesis of talk is demystifying electronics, but from web engineer's point of view, not from hardware hacker's point of view, because that's how I saw things were. So with any project, it start with story. I was at a local JavaScript conference in New York City, October 2014. There was a workshop on JavaScript hardware, and I blink my first LED. If you have never done a hardware hacking, blinking an LED is like a typing hello world in code. And you may be able to see on the really back, that's the five lines of code that took me to blink an LED. And I took a photo of it, and I tweeted about it, and I was so excited. It felt like just a blink, but I felt like I was a hardware hacker, and I could do anything. The internet of things and all the cool stuff I can do now because I wrote this five lines of code. At the same time, you know, continuing the theme of knitting and textile and hardware and everything, I discovered this machine called Jacquard Loom, which used punch card to store data, the pattern data, to automatically create a beautiful pattern. I discovered this while I was researching about punch card operated knitting machine. But accidentally, I discovered that this is a base of computer. This is a machine that Harman Hollis discovered and got inspired to use punch card system for his tabulating machine, which was more like a mechanical calculator, but later became IBM and later became base of computer. And FYI, the width of those punch card is 80 holes, and that's where the punch card code punch card 80 comes from, and that's where our code editor usually puts line on the 80s character. So I thought it was really cool. And I was like, I can't really build this machine in my New York City apartment, but maybe I can make a miniature of those things. So I tried to create a, the video will loop. I tried to create a my punch card machine that feeds my big punch card that sends the data into a computer and use my code to visualize the textile pattern, then put it into my knitting machine to output it as a text. So I basically made my own punch card computer. And this is a part of the talk that I'm supposed to say, yeah, I blinked LED and I was so interested, it's so fixed, and I got into this project and everything worked perfectly. In fact, it's not. It was a lot of frustrating. This was the only hardware project that I did, but became a hardware person somehow. So I wanted to share how I did this project while it was very frustrating. So let's start from very, very, very basic. Electric circuit. It's like creating a while loop in JavaScript. While the battery or power supply lasts, you need to do the thing that's hooked onto the wire, and you cannot stop this while loop. So in illustration, it looks like this. You have battery, and then you have some kind of output. Um, if you were doing the intro to hardware, maybe LED, maybe a buzzer. And I created a version of that in paper card and metallic tape, because I don't like the feel of wires and solders and, you know, Frankly, soldering island scares me. Um, so I made this one, and if I put battery on it, oop, you know, it's creating a closed loop, so it's, you know, blighting it up. So that works. So if, if you have a short circuit, the loop is distracted or cut off, you have something like this. So I'm going to hook the battery in here. 
And oh, I should switch that to here. So I'm going to hook the battery here. And it does not light up because the loop is cut off here. But you can put anything that's conductive, like knife, to make it lit up. Or let's see, money, maybe? Here's, let's try Polish money. There you go, I have American dollar. Like anything that's conductive, if you hook it up and create a loop, there will be electricity flow. So that's the basics. However, oops, so when you know this, then you can create switches. The basically, the knives and the manis that I just did is a type of switch. So in electronics parts, you may have things like this, which is a tilt switch. This is used to detect if some objects are tilted for a certain angle. What it is is that there's like a long wire and short wire, and that's not touching. And then there is a mercury liquid inside of this glass bowl. When you tilt it, because mercury is liquid metal, it flows and then make a contact with two wires and creates a loop. So if I tilt it, the LED will oops, light up. Yeah. Another one that's cool is lead switch. Lead switch is also two electronic parts that's almost touching but not really. And this is used for magnetic door. So I have lead switch here, and if I have, I have really strong magnet. If I put magnet close to it, because magnet pulls those two plates together, it makes contact and creates a circuit. So that's interesting, because I basically made like, a, if somebody knocks down something, buzz or something, like I didn't need to code any line at all. I could just make a hardware by making circuit and switches. But when you're making circuit, the things you need to be here, uh, worried about is electric current. If you overflow this circuit, and if any of the hardware that you, you hooked up into cannot handle those electric current, it will die. And I'm going to try to do that now. Um, this is a little scary. But I'm going to wire those together so that, so that the circuits are complete. Now, this light bulb takes 1.5 volts. And these battery is for 1.5 volts. This one here, 9 volts. So much. So let's try this. What's, I, don't, I don't know what's going to happen. If it smokes comes out, please run away. Um, there you go. Did you see that blink? And then I just killed it. I can't do anything with this battery anymore. I need to replace the light bulb. This one is basically done. And to me, this is like getting a sad clone when you're developing something and accidentally put a console log on like 10 million lines of Likode of data that you are dealing with. And inside Chrome or any of the browser case, you can just refresh it and get it start over. But in electronic case, once you kill it, you can't get it back. So you want to avoid that. So now, yep, it's back on. So you don't want to do that. How can we prevent that to be happening by accidentally hooking up a battery? You need something called a register. A register is a piece of thing that kind of prevents and kind of filters energy from flowing it in. And I got interested in like, huh, OK. So I just basically need to filter this amount of voltage. What can be the register? Well, it turns out things like this. The uh, pencil is a perfect register. So I have pencil rod here. I just like extracted it 
and put it in in between this circuit for now and try to kill this again like we did before with 9 volt battery. So I have resistor here and I have that 9 volt battery that killed the light bulb before and I'm going to put, put it and now it doesn't because this pencil rod is just filtering enough amount of electricity to light up the bulb but not all of it that's coming from the battery. What's cool about that so is that if I make this shorter, that means less amount of material is in between wires so that the light bulb gets brighter. So that's like halfway and this is full length, a little dimmer. The other thing that the resistor is used for is a heat. So because it is trying to filter all of the energy, it gets quite hot. That pencil lot was like warm to the touch already. And a lot of 3D printers in early generation, I've seen that register being a heat source to melt the plastic to extrude it, which I thought was weird, but kind of makes sense. So another high resistance material is this yarn that I found. It's called conductive yarn, but the strand itself does not work like a wires. So the yarn structure is that many fibers are kind of wind it together. So fibers are conductive, but it's loosely tied. So it's not quite wire yet. However, this has a tendency, if you squeeze it or if you pull it, to make all of the strands tight, then it conducts electricity. So if I put a thing, oh, actually, I should do this. If I put a electricity in here, and pull this or squeeze this to really tight, it, it lights up. And then if I relax it, it turns on. So now I can use these conductive material to make anything, like teddy bear, like if you squeeze it in light bulb, light up, you can do that. Um, I don't know the pencil a lot, but I'm sure you can find any use for it. Um, so this was super cool to me. I was like, oh, so like the hardware parts doesn't come in like ugly foam like this. You know, the register you see in the parts store is looking like this tiny, tiny bug-like looking thing with different colors and supposedly it's color coded about like what it is, but like you can never find what it is. And you know, you go into instruction and then you literally read, okay, red, blue, green, yellow. Okay, where is that? Like. I can never tell things apart. But you can make register out of your own. And if you know how register works, like pencil lots, lengths of the uh, materials in between the wires, change how much resistance that gives, you can potentiometer. You can make potentiometer. So here's a demo that I made. Potentiometer is basically the same thing as a pencil lot. But as you turn this knob, it changes the resistance of this <coughs> register, and it dims and it brightens up. Another one that's interesting is photosensitive one. So this is called light sensor, but it's really just a register. So. What's in here is a piece of metal, a special piece of metal that changes the distance based on light. So if it's brighter, it flows more electricity, and if it's dimmer, it does not. So if I cover it, it dims up, and with the light in camera, it's hard to tell, but you can see. And this is how um, thermostat works too. Thermostat is another piece of metal that change the property of resistance based on temperature, and that's how they control the, uh, that's how they know when temperature changes. So for now, 
we have been experiment with, uh, experimenting with having a piece of loop and by hand flipping switches and putting a sensors and you know making handmade electric circuit, which was fun. And you can certainly do a lot of things without any code, without any microcontroller. However, if I want to say control that by co code, or if I want to send the information to the internet, or display the information on the display, or make sound, how can I do that? Well, you may need thing called microcontroller. And this is a few of them that I have my house. None of them I really use, but because I got to be known as a hardware person, somehow people give it to me, which is kind of cool. Um, but I have those, and I pretty much use it for just this photo and then one demo I have. So what my controller is, for web developers' point of view, is it's like a mini server. Here's Arduino Uno. The microcontroller itself is this black box or chip that's there. And then everything else is just optional to make your life easier. It's kind of like the chip itself is a server hardware, but then by buying Arduino, you are just like getting a digital ocean one-click droplet. Like everything is configured and ready to go. So if you want the ready to go part, then go buy Arduino or any other development board. If you want to do install and app get and everything by your own, you may want to do the chip and that may be cheaper. So inside of that chip, they have CPU, they have flash memory, they have lab. It acts like a little computer and they can store the code and they can do the algorithmic on it and they can output a result based on that. This is a spec of a chip. So we were looking at simple loop before, but our loop expanded into like this. So you have microcontroller, which can create many loops. And based on certain loop, they can turn on and off light. So let's say they create a loop on A0 pin, and there's a photo register, so that's a light sensor. And when A0 pins loop is certain threshold, then microcontroller can turn on the pin 13 on the LED. So it's kind of like a server, like you, it can manage a different state and it can do a logic and you can use code to create that logic. I mentioned pins. Pins are like ports on the servers. So there's different pins and honestly, until I write this talk, I did not even know some of the details about it. So certain pins have a certain property that they can handle. It's kind of like you still have to code your own logic, but endpoint is already made it for you, for your API. So a certain endpoints that's already made and you will probably not touch is a power endpoint. It's basically getting power. Another set of a endpoints that's called analog in, and it's in Arduino's case, it starts with A from 0 to 5. And this one is interesting because it can take analog data, so it's a wave of data. But because in order to send it to computer, it needs to be digitalized. So using this pin can digitalize and then turn it into the analog wave into numbers. The digital pin on top, a lot of them are as named as digital. They can control on and off of some electric parts. However, up until now, I did not know what this tilde in front of certain numbers. And when you go into a lead instructions of certain hardware products, it says, put this LED on pin five and three. And I was always like, why can't I just do five and four? Why do I need to change it into three and like bend the wire? Here's why. If the, this tilde, is in front of the number, that means it can control the pulse of digital signal. So certain parts, like LED, it does not dim like light bulb. What it's actually doing is blinking intensely, and how far apart that blinking is can control the visible brightness of the LED. So they use on and off still, but they also track the 
interval of that on and off to get kind of like analog wavy data into it. So that's microcontroller. Okay, cool. Now we have server in web development term, server and ports figure that out and API design done. How can we code this thing? Now you need to code it in things called serial, serial communication. And that's kind of like dealing with dial up internet. So serial communication is binary communication. It is sending one bit at a time over wire into one machine to the other one. And this is same as your USB cable. Your USB cable is universal serial bus. So it's serial communication, but universal in terms of the port size and design, and bus in terms of one machine can handle different serial wires. So you, your computer can have multiple USB wires. So serial cable is sending a bunch of binary data like I see in here. And in plain English, it goes like this. The computer says, send A, because we agreed on A to be the start of the sentence. And Arduino says, A received. Um, we agree that if I get the A, then I send the data from pin 13. So I'm just going to start sending pin 13. And then computer is like leading, leading, okay, still data is coming, okay, okay, I don't know, just leading. And then they're like, oh, I found the slash n. We agreed on this as a last of the data so we can close this port and then lead this data that was coming in. And when computer wants to uh, send something in, then it says send B again. Uh, was not again, but send B, because we agree that if B is sent to Arduino Uno, then it is going to do that and bad and bad. So it's a lot of coding, but not easy or interesting kind of coding. It's not as easy and flowy as like writing a JavaScript events or writing jQuery handler. So what we can we do? Like do are we stuck with serial communication? No. Luckily, people in the community, the JavaScript community, already worked on abstracting this and turning it into JavaScript package. So the serial communication the most well-known one is Node Serial Port, made by Viru Tikigot. Um, and that was also ported into Browser Serial Port, because Chrome has a USB API already supported. So from your Chrome browser, you can control the hardware by serial communication. And abstraction for that is already done. On top of those serial abstraction, there is a hardware framework like Johnny 5 that was developed by a person who also contribute to jQuery. So it's almost as easy as writing a jQuery to wiggle the buttons to um, blink the LED. And that's what I did for my first one. So you can use those and then transfer that data over USB. Or newer chip, things like Tesla, try to put JavaScript on chip. So from a microcontroller to your computer code can also be plain JavaScript. You don't have to do this bridge of serial thing. So there is a lot of work being done. If you are interested in how this landscape works and how data is actually handled inside of the microcontroller, I highly recommend checking out my friend Suze Hinton's talk about babbling with the meow fork. And she used a cat in the office flipping a bit to send the data to brighten the LED. It's quite a fun talk. And if you're interested, highly, highly recommend it to check it out. So we learned about circuit. We learned about how to make switches, how to make sensors. And we learned about microcontrollers. And we came full circle. We now understand how hardware works. So this is how my. 8-bit punch card demo ended up looking like. I had a Arduino Uno hooked into a certain kind of hardware that I made. And as I showed on the photo, I used a metal rod as a push button, like a custom hardware, to create a circle of circuit to flow the electricity, treat it as a button. I code on Johnny 5, send the data into the web. 
and then have some kind of website that shows a status of the hardware because it's already connected to the internet. So I'm going to show a demo that I made which basically does this. So I was told no live coding, so I made very simple internet-enabled LED light. What it does is it's con connected to this computer, which is providing an internet connection to this microcontroller. But my phone is not connected to any of this device. My phone is just connected to the cellular data. And I am accessing a website that is controlling this light. So if I click on, say, button here, I can change the color, and it's completely done over the internet. And I am using socket IO to create the real-time feedback of it. So I don't have any timers. Oh, I have four minutes. So we can look at very, very simple code. So LED, it's just this. You import a uh, JavaScript robotics framework, Journey 5. You also import a socket IO client to handle WebSocket connection. This part about creating a board and waiting for the board to be ready is like creating a document and waiting for the document ready in JavaScript. Um, connection to the board takes a little time, more than you know, fast load of the website, so you need to wrap that in callback. But once the board is ready, you can go create a LED instance, so here. You can specify which pin on the Arduino this LED is connected. You turn on the LED, and you wait for the socket connection to come in. When socket connection is come in, socket connection will have a data about which color this LED should be. And depending on the value, you change the color of LED. Server side is very simple express application, and I don't even need to use express for this. But basically, the first half part is just set it up to serve a single page static website. And here's the only important part, which is creating a socket, bridging the socket connection. So if this hardware sends a, oh, somebody figured that out, the URL, it's going crazy. <laughs> um, if this Arduino or Arduino connected uh, computer sends a socket information to the server, it receives the data and then broadcast it to whatever the device that's connected on. So some of you figure that out, the URL, you are now connected to the server, that's this. And then on the controller side, I have a bunch of buttons, as you can see. And there's three lines of JavaScript that says, create a socket connection, and whenever somebody pushes the button, pass the value of the button into socket connection. And that's how I, this is going like a party light. <laughs> That's how this device is made. So together, within this 30 minutes, we just made internet of things. <laughs> so this is my favorite quote from research when I was doing a hardware and computing and textile. Um, William Mollis is a leader of arts and crafts movement. And this is kind of interesting that I mention arts and crafts because arts and crafts movement in UK, sometimes known as untime uh, technology. So this was a movement that came along when industrial revolution happened and man made cheap clothes and cheap art and cheap everything was going over. And William Mollis thought that we really should think about, think, go back and think about handicraft, craftsmanship of artisan of making something. And he published a lot of uh, novels and essays and things. But one quote he said in meeting of the arts and class movement is that we do not reject the machine. They are not actually anti-machinery, but we welcome it, but we would desire to see it mastered. In other words, he was saying that don't just get any of that framework and library and without understanding, glue it together and sell it. You can 
do that same thing as long as you understand what it actually does. And this became kind of um, my stance on going into anything new, was that anything can be very small, and anything can be very understandable as long as you spend some time to understand it. So the hardware demo that I just did and the 8-bit mach machine I, can, I made, I could have just gone into a um, few friends in New York City who actually work on those library and ask them five minutes question and be done with it without understanding anything. But I wanted to understand it so that I can talk about that and I can replicate it again when I need to do something else that's slightly related but out of the scope. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Again, I will be tweeting my slide on this um, handle. And if you're interested in creating a internet-enabled hardware and not uh, kind of want to get a kind of templated version of the code that I just show, I have a GitHub repo that has the code sample. Thank you very much.